Hey, this is VHS Massacre Radio. I'm your host, Tom Seymour. And I'm your other host, Ken Powell. And, uh, yeah, we're doing the Twitch thing, uh, nice. getting into that realm. That should be a lot of fun. Should be. Hopefully this one works this week. Um, um, you know, there, there is a test broadcast I posted earlier this week, if you guys want to check that one out, too. I played uh, Robin Hood, Prince of Thieves on the NES. <laughs> nice. Um, yeah, I was a little unprepared because I, I, you know, I was telling you, I was about maybe doing these NES games where, like, they had movies mm-hmm. um, and, and comparing the two, the movie to the game itself. Ah, so I just, that sounds great. Yeah, I pulled up Robin Hood, Prince of Thieves and gave that one a go. It's actually not a bad game. Really? Like, I'm really shocked. I don't know if you're familiar with the Elder Scroll games. Hmm. No, I've never played them. I mean, I know of them, but yeah, them, yeah um, well, you know, very popular RPG games, and there's a lot of elements in those that are in this game. Um, so, and it's an NES game. This is the eight bit eight bit era, but there's actually a lot of layers to it, and I was kind of surprised. It's not a bad game. Well, you know what I want to do? Hold on, I'm gonna get up just for a second because I want to show people this. So when when we get into that segment where we're showing. The we're watching the movie and then playing the game. Um, I want to. I think we can get into playing some Commodore sixty four games. So this is my Commodore 64, 64 mini, which is pretty cool. Um, you could load games on via USB, and uh, it comes with about I think about I think sixty four games it comes with. Um, but this was pretty cool. It's a little pricey though. It was like a hundred fifty bucks. Hundred fifty bucks. Yeah. I mean. I guess it's kind of almost the going rate for well. I guess it is a little bit more like the NES Classic. I think it's like seventy five. The Super NES is like I think seventy five also. Yeah, yeah. So it's 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 a little steep, but um. But you said it has sixty four games. Sixty four games. Yeah. Well, that's twice the amount of the games that those systems have. Yeah, um, and you know it's it, people don't realize that Commodore sixty four was the best selling computer in history. Best-selling personal computer in history, you know. Wow. Yeah. But, um, well, I was doing some research too for the games, and I think there's plenty out there, uh, oh, cool. movie-based games. Actually, some of the better games, like um, the Ghostbusters, is yeah. notorious for having a really shitty NES game. <laughs> yeah. but I think the Com- Commodore 64 actually has a, a, a an actual real game. Yeah. That um, has the I, Ghostbusters doing Ghostbuster things. I used to play it. I used to play it all the time. I I loved it, you know. So I, I thought I thought it was pretty strong. Um, let's see. So, oh my God! So, Joe Bob Briggs movie marathon. He's back. He's yes. back. Um, after a few little, I guess, technical difficulties, he broke broke the internet, as they say. Uh, I was but, one of the people who could not get on Shutter. Yeah, I missed like I don't know, but I, I think I caught the last thirty minutes of Taurus Trap, oh. and I've never seen Taurus Trap. I've never seen it either. It's awesome. <laughs> it, it is very awesome, but I'm like, I'm like, oh, this, the telekinesis thing just kind of threw me for a loop because it is very disturbing. Like the the mannequins, the imagery, Chuck Connors, yeah, as the uh, I guess the evildoer. Um, the telekinesis thing is, is it added an extra layer that I was like, might not have, might didn't have to go that way. They could have just had like the. Well, I will tell you. I didn't even know there was telekinesis. All I didn't know if it was he was just magical and was turning people into to marionettes or puppet or you know mannequins or I, I had no clue what was going on. But yeah, it, well, it, I guess it does add to the madness of the film. Like uh, the closing shot is you know the lead lady driving off with her friends all turned into mannequins and she has like this crazed look on her eyes so it, it could have been just like all maybe it wasn't like telekinesis but uh, i think that's what it was implying that he had like these magical powers so he was he was making her see these things no i think he actually was doing those things but you could i guess if you want to try to dig deeper into a movie maybe that might not be that deep you'd be like yeah maybe he actually was just driving her crazy with these mannequins because they i mean mannequins are kind of freaky Oh yeah, I mean they did such a great job with match cuts and and uh, you know making it you know at times fairly seamless where it would cut from 
he'd walk up to some guy and take his arm off. And yeah. It was pretty disturbing, you know? Oh, absolutely. I mean, for what Joe Bob Briggs would, would call trash cinema, it was pretty awesome, you know? Oh, yeah. I mean, I think it was a great first choice to get back into the, the Joe Bob um, swing of things. Uh, that movie, though, like, I feel like it was the beginning of kind of our obsession with mannequins because they're like in the 80s there was a lot of mannequin related uh i think twilight zone did a couple of episodes based on mannequins in the 80s mm -hmm. there's the the mannequin movies themselves like yep. one and two yep and which then, i like i like yeah. those <laughs> i haven't seen them since i think the 80s so i don't know if they've aged out as well as some of the other 80s stuff uh, no they haven't aged well but it's like if you well they're just so hyper 80s that like if you want to revisit that it's fine as far as like being i don't know it's hard to say i mean they're so locked in the 80s you know yeah. so it's like if you if you like that then there'll be classics but you, you know certain people are going to go back to that and and not even be able to watch it i suppose I know it doesn't star James Spader, but it has a guy, right, that looks kind of like Spader? Or I, reminds him? I think it, Spader's in one of them. Oh, maybe is he? Well, maybe, yeah, maybe. Or something. maybe yeah, he is. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I think Spader's in one of them. He plays a creep, and and he plays like a manager in one of them. He's a guy, I would believe, that was fall in love with the mannequin. <laughs> the, the actual mannequin, not the la the mannequin that turns into the lady. Right, right. The mannequin itself. Yep. Uh, but yeah, yeah, Tourist Trap, definitely a disturbing movie. One of those that I, you know, like I said, I hadn't come across. It. I've seen the the artwork from it before, but I think, as Joe Bob alluded to, that the name Tourist Trap kind of throws you for a loop that it's more going to be more of like a, a Disney-esque, like he, he talked about Parent Trap. Yeah, exactly. Parent Trap or like, you know, I don't know. It could be like a Chevy Chase comedy. Like, you don't <laughs> yeah. know what, what it's going to be. And that's why I never, like when they announced Tourist Trap, I'm like, I actually don't know what that is, but... um so yeah, so Joe Bob, he his twenty four hour marathon is so popular it crashes Shutter, yeah, um, to a point of you know functioning half the time. So I saw, I don't know, maybe two or three films. Um, it was great to see um, it, Tourist Trap, and then uh, what else was I checking out? Well, I, I watched uh, Sleepaway Camp. Oh yes, and... the end of Sleepaway Camp. Still so disturbing. Still so disturbing. Yeah. But if you think about it intellectually, like, it's not that big of a deal. I mean, yes, the killer is a murderer. That would be the most important thing. But it is odd that they're like, oh my God, it's a man. <laughs> yeah. Not that it's a, a naked person. A naked person with a knife yeah. making a fake, crazy face. Crazy. One of the most disturbing, craziest faces in all of cinema, period, whose uh, a boy's head just rolled out of her lap. Yep. And the guy's like, it's a man. <laughs> it's a man. <laughs> and the first thought is like, oh my God, t take him run down. Run for your life. Yeah, yeah, run, yeah, run for your life. Yeah, um, absolutely disturbing film. Uh, to me, still holds up very well. Uh, it does have some 80s scenes in there, but... Uh, I think it's still really great. I there's the creepy. I mean, Joe Bob covered these things in his breakdown, but the the creepy perverted uh, chef. That's like I don't know if we'd even attempt though kind of these kind of characters in movies today. Um, but uh, Felicia Rose, he had her um, back to talk about her character Angela, which she's most famous for. Um, so it was great having her, you know, add some insight and go over the details. Um, and then he had, you know, he had um, what they, he, historically he's had what they call the male, male girl. Mm -hmm. And they were making fun of the fact that, like, because um, the star of Sleepaway Camp, like, I was the first male girl, male, <laughs> male female male. Yeah. But, um, but um, I was thinking, I was like, is he going to have a male girl? Because, you know, is that, you know, these days is that... Um, sort of like politically correct or whatever, but I mean that the the male girl was like she's a model. Like I mean that's her, mm -hmm. that's she that's the work she likes to do, you know. And they had really funny banter back and forth. Yeah. And her character was kind of cool. She was sort of like contemporary texting during the show and stuff like that. And yeah. I thought it worked great, you know. Yeah, yeah, absolutely, it worked great and. You know, Joe Bob kind of covered some of his history um, beforehand, and like seeing how long he's been doing this, like well over thirty years now, 
and um, but still like uh, very modern on topic. Like I mean, he was even covering some issues of like the current political scene, like kind of yep. thrown in there, um, which is uh, you know was very funny. Um, but he also wasn't afraid to like go into some places that I think some like a network TV station might not have allowed them to. Which yeah. is great that you know doing it on Shutter I think was like the perfect place. Shutter, yeah, Shutter's perfect. There's a there it's a pretty there's a paywall and it, yeah. it's in if you're paying to get access to horror films, that audience is, is gonna look for surprise or shock or not that it was shocking at all, but the the point is like that's that's the target audience, you know, and and so I I thought it was perfect. Um, I you know the funny thing about Joe Bob Briggs is he's a pretty brilliant man, and it's sort of he he sort of hides it through this like um, domestic beer drinking good old boy oh, cow, cowboy yeah. thing, but I mean the guy is like super smart. Oh, savant! I mean he's just. His wealth of knowledge, not only about films themselves, but like Chuck Connors and the like. He gave this whole thing about how Connors started off as a baseball player, or played in the NBA for a few seasons, and like all these little things that he would know about actors, or uh, like well, he went into uh, during Sleepaway Camp, like at the beginning about the transgender laws in North Carolina, and like all these little little bits of knowledge. It was just it was he's amazing. He's a, a, a a guy that I should have been on TV at all times. There should have never been a break from Joe Bob. I mean, unless he wanted the break, but yeah, I mean, he he um he, he also he he's a master storyteller, and if you ever, I mean, you just listen to his cadence, hit the rhythm. I mean, listen to how I talk. I'm my I say I have uhs and and ums all day long. This guy speaks in these like. Like really entertaining, um, you know, wonderful paragraphs of information, yeah. and you can just listen to the guy for, um, you know, for like when we interviewed him for the VHS Massacre, we were captivated, you know. Oh, absolutely. We could we would have kept him out there all night if we could. I mean, he is amazing to listen to on TV or in person, and um, I'm hoping that this because. Like we say, he crashed the the app itself. Uh, I struggled to get on forever. Like I, I gave up after the first uh, hour. I yeah, was like, uh, I did too. It's like I just cross my fingers. Hopefully, they do the right thing. They'll archive this and post it on uh, post it on the app, which they ended up doing. I think like a, the day after. And um, but he crashed it. So hopefully, Shutter takes a note. And if he wants to do it, maybe they'll turn it into a, a, a series. I don't know, six to twelve movies, you know, every year would be great. I mean, if you look at the breakdown on the on the Shutter website, there's there's actually I think fourteen. Really, there's twelve proper sort of driving episodes, and then he's got a couple like behind the scenes and then testimonies and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. um, but he in twenty four hours he created twelve episodes, and they're kind of like real drive-in episodes, you know. Yeah. Um, uh, I thought that was that was was great. I, I honestly I don't know how he did that twenty four hour marathon for a while. I was like, is he really doing this? And I, you know, I think he really did it. And the only thing I can think is there's got to be maybe one or two movies where he intros them and then goes and sleeps for two hours yeah. and then gets up. You know? Yeah, yeah, probably. Yeah, I mean, he's he's an older gentleman too. So like, you know. Even at my age, I value my 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 sleep, and we we, we done, I couldn't do it. We I could our, not do what he did. We done our own crapathon like six years ago, and you know we weren't uh, anywhere. We weren't uh, performing every uh, half hour, and by the I don't know, it was like three or four a.m. We were like crashed out. Oh yeah, but we were watching a, a little bit shittier movies. We, like, yeah, like, we we handpicked some of the worst. Was that Beast one? Beast of the Wild? Or Beast something? of the Yucca Flats. Oh, God. There were so many bad ones. The go uh, go Hobgoblin. Um, what was it? There's a movie Joe Bob Briggs brought up. He screened it. It was like one of the few movies he didn't give four stars. And it was something like Super Beast. Or, and he was like, there's no Beast. There was never a Beast. <laughs> uh, but um, anyway, I, you know, of course, I'm I'm tweeting. I'm like... You created twelve episodes in twenty four hours. 
you know, can you do this every six months? I mean, that would be great. That would be absolutely amazing. He wouldn't have to do a marathon, I don't think, you know, from here on out. He could just do, you know, um, uh, every every Friday night for, like, I don't know, three months, host, like, maybe two movies. Yeah. And, you know, and then the male girl would have, I think, a little bit more, um, you know, we'd be actually sending mail. And, mm-hmm. I mean, even though know, they did have, like, a lot of emails and stuff like that, Facebook posts and all that, but... Um, I think it's amazing. It shows a testament of like the impact that he's had going back from the 80s when he was on the, the movie channel up until Monster Vision and even his you know God stuff on, on The Daily Show. Like, mm-hmm. He's just maintained a, 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 as a fixture in uh, B-movie, bad movie, uh, pop culture. I think he was one of the first people to legitimize, truly legitimize what he'd call trash cinema. You know, yeah. and, and I don't know if that, I think trash cinema, maybe that encompasses all of that sort of uh, exploitation and cult and all that. And uh, he, when you know, he would talk about it, he would never really be disrespectful about the films. He really liked the stuff. Yeah. And that's, and, and so did millions of people. That's, you know, they, that's why these films were made and people watched them. It's just... Like, in the mainstream, for the longest time, you didn't really talk about those kind of films. They weren't, no. you know, so... Because, I guess, one of my friends, Craig, Craig had, um... I think it was... What was he on? Cinemax? No, it was... The Movie Channel. Movie Channel. We would watch, um, Joe Bob, and we really got into these, you know, these trash cinema movies, and, uh, you know, like Toxic Avenger and all that stuff. Although I would say that's a classic, not a, not trash cinema. But, um, yeah, so I never, I guess it sort of warped my brain. I never thought of those films as less than, uh, than, uh, than other films. Uh, yeah, I've always felt like they're on equal footing. They, they both, you know, um, Hollywood and trash cinema, um, B-movies, exploitation, I feel like they've all offer something. Mm-hmm. It's just, it's up to you to like you know look inside yourself or inside the movie and figure out what it has to um to offer. Um, but I mean he just think about this. This man loves these movies so much that in the eighties he tried to prevent Times Square and you know whenever it changed over to being I guess what it is today, which is very Disney esque. Um, but it used to be like uh, porno theaters and. Grand houses. Grand house, grand houses yeah. He was fighting to keep them from changing that. And if you, if you're old enough to remember, that Times Square was probably not really worth saving. Not not, not with everything else that came with it. But he loved these movies so much, though he felt like it was worth saving. Um, so that tells you his testament to like how how much he's. Uh, I guess you know he just he absolutely loves this stuff. It shows whenever you listen to him talk about them. And like you say, he never talks about them in like necessarily a a complete negative way like I think he does understand like you know this might not be a great movie might not even be a good movie but there is some kind of worth there yeah absolutely I was um I gotta look through my photos for a second but I was trying to find the uh oh okay this is great so Joe Bob Briggs has this thing called the drive-in oath I don't have you ever read this I know <laughs> I because this was new to me too so he, he's got the drive-in oath we are driving mutants. We are not like other people. We are sick. We are disgusting. We believe in blood and breasts and and beasts. In life, if life had a vomit meter, we'd be off the scale. As long as one drive-in remains on planet Earth, we will party like jungle animals. We will um, boogie till we puke. Heads will roll. The drive-in will never die. So, um... And I thought that was kind of insightful, too. It's sort of like acknowledging that, yeah, um, we kind of like sick shit. And it's it like, he's not... What I liked about reading this recently is that, in my head, it's like, do you have to justify liking exploitation or trash cinema? Do you have to intellectualize it? Because a lot of it's not, like, <clears throat> it's not what you call politically correct. But Joe Bob never sort of made excuses for it. He was just like, I like this stuff. And, and it's, it's a weird time we're in where you can't, it seems like you can't even admit, admit what kind of stuff you like, you know? 
Yeah, I think so. I mean, it, it is, you know, with the current climate, it can be dangerous to admitting to liking certain things. Um, you know, it, and it's it's a, a fine line, and I understand where, like, some people are coming from, but then I'm, like, also, like, I don't feel like you should be ashamed to, like, be like, yes, I love seeing boobs in a movie. <laughs> like, yeah. I just, it, yeah. it's... It's not porno. It's, it's just, you know, it, it's... I mean, you look, you look at... Shakespeare, you know, I mean, how much, um, or Hamlet, you know, it's like how much death and, you know, or, you know, Julius Caesar, like, I mean, there's murder and death and sex and, and, and all your classic literature, you know, so it's like, why, why is it different now? Like, do we, yeah. does everything need to be sort of tame, you know? Uh, I feel like it's almost probably better to admit that you absolutely love porno versus actually liking trash cinema sometimes <laughs> like i mean it's it's kind of like the weird the how the the i guess you know it swung swings around uh, these things yeah um, like uh w sean would talk about how um like younger people would judge her for doing nudity in, in horror films meanwhile like their role model is kim kardashian who has done two pornos essentially. No, yeah, I mean, that's I've, what they are. They're that's pornos. That's how she's famous. From yeah, yeah, doing a video, a sex video with another famous, more famous person at the time than her. Yeah, yeah. Um, so yeah, I mean, it's it's crazy. I think that um, you know, as long as that the, the women that worked on the movie, as long as they haven't been um, mistreated in any type of way, and that they you know uh, freely took the role and are comfortable 100% with doing the nudity just to me there's nothing wrong there's with it it's wrong it's with it, yeah. it's great i mean it, it's, it's still art i mean that's the thing that makes me mad like most colleges have li uh, live um model drawing yeah and and it's nude your standard um li you know live um drawing class is a nude model it's art I'm sorry, trash cinema is still art. You know, you you can not like it, um, but I don't I don't like the tearing down of it. Is is what I, my point? You know. No, no. Um, I mean, I, just be like, it's not for me. It's not my taste, and then kind of move on. I, I mean, I'm not going to rip on somebody who loves romantic comedies, even though like I don't I don't like them. <laughs> but right, I, yeah. you know, I'm not going to rip on somebody uh, for that. So. Uh, I'll, I'll take my Toxic Avenger, and you can take your um, I Have Mail. Failure and, to launch. Failure or... to launch. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> You've got mail. Wow. Going yeah. back. Is that Tom Hanks and yeah. uh, Meg Ryan? I think so. Um, should we Should we get into the uh, movie of the week? Movie of the week. Yeah. Escape from the Bronx. Escape from the Bronx. Yeah. Let's Let's hear your thoughts. Well, this is a sequel to last week's movie. Um, I guess it's kind of like a direct sequel. It seems like it takes place almost immediately following the events of um, uh, 19, uh, 1990 Bronx Warrior. Uh, our lead is the exact same lead, Mark Ger uh, Gregory. He's playing Trash again. And even though this movie was shot not too long after that one, he kind of looks a little older for some reason. Yeah, he. Ha I mean, in... The, the 1990 Bronx Warrior, he had, like, super baby face. Yeah. Now he looks a little older. He didn't look quite as uh, ripped as he did. Uh, no, and I think know? this movie, I mean, they were only filmed months apart. Like, I mean, whatever one was completed, he moved on to the next one. I think there is a movie that came in between these three uh, that's not, like, officially part of this sequence. But he filmed three movies within, I think, a two-year period. I feel like, you know, whatever money or whatever Trash is doing, like, I don't know if he's putting it up his nose or I mean, he just, like, <laughs> he didn't Something look the same. Happened. Like, yeah. Well, you know, like, when I was looking at this on IMDb, it, uh, internationally, um, it was called Bronx Warrior 2. Yeah. And then, um, it was also called Escape 2000. And I think Mystery Science Theater did a, a spoof on it. Spoof of the, yeah, uh, Escape 2000. So, I mean, it's so funny because, like, I mean, over here, it's uh, Escape from, from Bronx. Clearly ripping off of John Carpenter. Yeah, I think they were trying to do probably a couple of things. Uh, one, you know, rip on the John Carpenter thing, which, the, you know, the, you can tell this director has, he definitely likes um, John Carpenter's movies. Oh, yeah. But also, I think, to distance itself from 1900 Bronx Warrior, 
um, by calling it something else. Because I think you can, you, you can watch this movie and not have seen the other one and yeah. still, like, you know, like, not feel like you missed anything. Yeah. Um, the director is uh, Enzo G. What is like, it? Cascarelli? Castellar- Cas- Castellari. Sorry. Castellari. Yeah, our Italian Enzo names. Castellari. Yeah, yeah. yeah, sorry about that. Um, yeah, um, and I thought. Um, I thought this was like a huge improvement over the first one, personally. Uh, I mean, I I like the music better. Yeah. Um, I think some of the actions, uh, set set pieces and scenes were actually uh, pretty good. Um, there's one scene where um, this crazy explosion happens, and he's sort of like falling down this ladder that's like hanging. Yes. And he falls all the way down, and the, the it's it becomes like pit in the pendulum. This heavy metal like sort of like step ladder, sort of fire escape type thing is dangling above his head, and suspension of disbelief is just really great. You really believe in the sort of uh, the, whatever fear factor. Forgive me, uh, and, but it was I thought it was really cool. Yeah, actually, that, that to me is the the scene that stands out the most, just because it's so well done. Um, with a lot of B movies, sometimes there's uh, the you know um, what would you call it? Well, with your shots, you got to be very frugal, I guess, yes. with how much you know footage you can cover and everything. And this one was really well covered. You absolutely felt like that there was this tension of this ladder waiting for it to drop on our hero character. Um, really well done. Uh, I think they, they extended it out like even a longer time than you would kind of anticipate with these kind of movies because a lot of these um, movies on the cheaper side will have shown the ladder shaking and then cut to like the ladder falling almost immediately. But this one like kept the ladder shaking and you kept like waiting. Like, is he going to, you know, like duck out of the way in time? Um, there's also uh, something that we didn't talk about last week. Um, we kind of mentioned some of the uh, uh, practical effects, but. Again, with the practical effects, with the flamethrowers, I felt like are really well done. Like it's very convincing. Like in the beginning, these guys are going around clearing out the Bronx, and like they light this homeless guy on fire, and it's it's really well done for a movie of this magnitude. I mean, you you sort of definitely have to question the practicality of of walking through the Bronx with flamethrowers <laughs> yeah. as the most effective way to kill people, but. Um, Beyond that, yeah. it looked awesome. Yeah, um, absolutely. Yeah, and it's kind of it's like a nice kind of fucked up beginning to a movie. Yeah. Um, it it was funny. They're they're essentially wearing spacesuits. Uh, yeah, know. the suits are kind of silly looking. Yeah. Um, but um, yeah, I, I thought that stuff was great. I mean, they it rem- it was almost reminded me a tiny bit of uh, the beginning of Dawn, Dawn of the Dead. Oh, yeah. Where they're kicking in the, they're in like the ghetto and they're kicking in the doors and just shooting people. Um, but um, yeah, I thought that was great. Um, so uh, I should mention Henry Silva as Floyd uh, Wrangler, and he was like the the villain essentially, yeah. um, who was basically a Nazi. <laughs> Yeah, well, we have some. We talked about the last movie having some imagery, Nazi imagery. Mm-hmm. This movie also was basically the Nazi guy, but also like our hero. I don't know if he had this in the first movie, but he had a jacket with the Confederate flag I, on. I don't was, think I never saw it in the first film. Yeah, I didn't catch it, and uh, so with these two movies, I'm like, I don't. It's, I, I, I don't know. It's a little questionable. Like, okay, what is this guy? Is he like? Does he really? Is he into this kind of stuff, or does he feel like this is kind of like? the like punk thing to do I can't I could never I can't make an excuse nor would I want to excuse someone wearing a confederate patch but I guess if it's an cuz essentially this is emulating American cinema so it's a bunch of Italians um and you know part of it is shot clearly in New York yeah. um but um maybe there's just not quite the depth of awareness, and also in the eighties, like things like um, uh, Dukes of Hazards, and yeah. they 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 kind of had the Confederate flag and around a lot. It was on the car. Yeah, um, I think the rationalization is that it's quote quote rebels. Yeah. Right? yeah. So 
the Bronx gang are re- rebelling. It's the rebellion, but it's not cool to have a Confederate flag. <laughs> no, it's not. I mean, and, and I think taking along it's this Bible codes with like the with the Dukes of Hazard. You had the Duke boys who were the good guys, but they were also kind of the outlaws and. Especially back in the day, I mean, it's still kind of true today. When we know in the current climate, where like they're removing the Confederate flag for good reason, but you know, then it was like kind of like a sense of pride is what they were saying, but also like they were rebel rebellion against the sheriff Roscoe. And uh, I mean, I, I I love that TV show, but it is like I, I can't watch it and be like, you know, this is this is a, the, a cool like, or they they should continue doing this. Yeah, I think I, with this movie though. With the Nazi thing from earlier, and now with this thing with the the patch, I don't know. It just, I'm like, I need to maybe investigate this guy a little bit <laughs> more. This just to see, yeah, this director just just to see. It's I like just make sure Mussolini's grandkid or something. <laughs> um, but other than that, yeah, I think this is a superior film. Uh, not, I wouldn't say like superior film, but it is a, a better film than the um, the first one. Yeah. So I think maybe with the you know running through that first one, and then he directed another one, and he directed this one. But I think, you know, we're, it's pretty clear, right? Our issue is that the good guys have occasional swastikas <laughs> yes. and, and, and uh, the Confederate flag. If and, it was the bad guys, who gives a fuck? Yeah, because, you know? I mean, they're, they're bad a guys. Good ba- it makes a, a, a quality bad guy if they're Yeah, absolutely. Really I mean, and, and, like, I have, I don't have a problem with, like, the Confederate flag being used in a movie whenever it has, like, a purpose, whenever you, like... If you're dealing with an outlaw, outlaw bark, biker gang, yes, that imagery is used all the time. And if they're the bad guys, then that's what they would wear, and that makes it uh, easier for whenever they're murdered off by the good guy. <laughs> we can, we, it's justified. But whenever you have the hero, and he's clearly the hero because he's survived the first one, he's the hero in the second one. Um, it, it, it makes it a little, a little tougher to like. like Actually, it pulls me kind of out of the movie and makes me think, going back to this director, like, <laughs> right, what is this yeah. director trying like, to do? What, what is he trying to say? Yeah. And, you know, he, who knows, yeah. I mean, like, even in Troma's library, they have a few movies that have, like, the Rebel flag, like the Redneck movie. and uh, Yeah, sure. Yeah. And, but uh, they were, like, I mean, they're... They're, they're depicting... Depicting a certain, like, I mean, in bad, the South... Badly behaved... Well, and, and in the south that is still yeah in the south that is still a symbol you will see a lot even though like despite the removal from a lot of places you'll still see it flying in the, the back of a truck of somebody or out in the yard of somebody's house you'll still see that symbol so it it makes sense for this movie set in the new york city though i mean it's it's a little weird <laughs> i just say it's a little weird yep uh and then the lead Lead actress uh, was Valeria de Obisi as Moon Gray, the mm. reporter. Who uh, she's sort of like the um, gussy reporter trying to get the word out, and you think you think it's gonna end <laughs> end with something, and she just gets greased like kind of fast. Oh uh, yeah, uh, well I mean this is the second girl like he's kind of lost in a movie too. It's like yeah. trash just. Love just, is not in the cards. <laughs> yep. Um, he goes on this big diatribe about like, there's this underground and uh, this actor. I I think he's supposed to be Latino, I guess. Yeah. And I was like, this looks like a really hairy Italian guy. <laughs> um, Who she probably was. Who she probably was, given that it's an Italian film. And uh, they live in the underground, and Trash is sort of like, yeah, you sold out. You, you're a wimp. You went underground too fast. And then he goes back home to find his parents burned alive because they were the holdouts, you know. So it's, it's an interesting message. Which is kind of weird because, like, I'm like, when they, I, I found out Trash had parents, I'm like, I don't remember them from the original. I guess it wasn't. <laughs> right. A big his deal, parents but. were, like, lovely people. Like, the, I mean, the, the mother seemed sweet, and the guy was, yeah, you know, living in his neat Bronx apartment, <laughs> hit their one bedroom. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it was a little strange. Um, but he was that, drinking, a, like, a drinking a bud and it just feels pretty domesticated considering the last film yeah well you know what we should do since we're doing the twitch thing now why don't I play a clip a trailer from yes. the movie let's just do gunplay just a ton of some decent gore too like when they would smash 
There's a couple scenes where they smash people's head, heads in. It's yeah. like the motorcycle people, and they smash their uh, visors in. And yeah, I think Trauma would be proud. Like yeah. some, of the, some of these practical effects that they they, they used. Um, like I say, I feel like you know they've worked on a couple of other films before this one. Got a lot of good practice in. I'm assuming a lot of the the crew was the same. So they learned a lot, applied it in their their lessons. Um, I, I would be interested in knowing exactly how big this budget was. Um, like, yeah, like, I was looking it up. I, I couldn't. I couldn't find a budget on it. Yeah, I mean, I know. Like, uh, I think Italy financed uh, a, a lot of this movie. The reason why they had to shoot like the interiors in um, Italy and the exteriors were done in New York City. So uh, who knows exactly how much they got? But it feels like it was like if you told me it was a million dollars, I feel like that'd be believable. For yeah. This movie. Oh yeah. I, but I but if you also it. said it was a hundred thousand dollars, I'd be like, yeah, that might. That's kind of believable too. Yeah, I guess it really just depends. I mean, there's a lot of gunplay. Not a lot of, not a ton of squibs. A lot of people getting mowed down yeah, yeah. with no body damage, you yeah. know. But um, it, it never bothered me to a point um, where, where I wasn't into it. You, you know what I was thinking about, um, too, was, you know how we talked about how maybe the world's view of the Bronx at that time, like this was came out in 83, yeah, so, which means they shot it in early '80s, and the first one they it could have been late '70s when they shot the first one. Yeah, like the the view of the Bronx was different, right? Like uh, the, you you had mentioned, like the Bronx, like a large portion of it burned down in the in the late '70s. Yeah, and so I, I I was looking that stuff up, and the New York Post had written about it, and the what they what the biggest sort of miss conception about that was that they claimed it was like mass insurance fraud Mm -hmm. that that people were just um kicking people on the building and burning it down for the insurance money but what they said was actually what happened was they shut down a ton of uh fire stations so uh it was a mass shutdown and they calculated the shutdowns based upon response time so it was something like if they had a slow response time, they just shut them down. And the the data was really flawed. Yeah. Because it wasn't. I mean, they didn't even track how the data was gathered. Yeah. I think there's even a, maybe even a documentary about that too, about the Bronx fire. Um, it might have been Bronx on fire or something like that. Um, yeah, that covers that. Like you know, another thing that was happening in the '70s is a lot of fires were happening, and uh, I think a lot of it was because of the closures of the fire stations, and then with the. Um, the heat wave and then the um, the power that you know shut off in the city, which led to desolation in parts of the Bronx, but also Brooklyn. There's areas areas of Brooklyn that um, went from like you know really thriving um, parts of the city to being kind of slums, and uh, only within the last five to ten years have kind of made a trend back up. And but not all the Bron- all of Brooklyn has. And just like in the Bronx, it's, I think we've talked about this on the podcast when we knew that James was moving out to the Bronx. Mm-hmm. And like the Bronx would seemingly be the next place because the Brooklyn's already experiencing it. It's, it's, you know, kind of, you can call it gentrification or renaissance. I guess it yep. depends on which side right, of the sure, fence. Yeah. But it, it's, it's, it's improved in terms of, I think, the quality of living in the buildings. I don't know if it's gotten, is it a better culturally? I don't know. That's not for me to say. I don't know. Um, depends on how you feel about Whole Foods and <laughs> things like that. Yeah. Um, but the Bronx would be, in theory, the next place because it's like you know. It's still cheap out still there. Still cheap. It's um, uh, the train is, you know, reasonably close. I mean, you, you can yeah. grab a train and get to Midtown, and you know, not that long. You know, I don't know, forty-five minutes an hour or something like that. Yeah. I mean, you could go from the the top of New York City to the bottom on a on a, a single train. So uh, it seems like it would be the next place that would experience its, you know, revitalization. But yeah. we'll, we'll, we shall see. Like, I still feel like it. There's. Uh, I think I talked about it last time. Somebody, a comedian, was like, "If you read one of these crazy articles in the newspaper, it's either Florida or the Bronx. <laughs> it's like alligator eats woman out of toilet. It's like <laughs> it's either happened in Florida or happened in the Bronx. That's funny. So." Um, I think the Bronx is still kind of in that category. There's a sad story of the kid that was stabbed to death um, by this gang. And you still get uh, stories like that out of the Bronx. Um, so Yeah, it's it's definitely 
still has you know a ton of problems. Um, the but it's interesting too, like the the international perspective on like this is must be why there was so many damn Bronx movies, right? Yeah, I think so. They calling everything Bronx, like Rumble in the Bronx that was shot in the. It came out in the '90s, but that was probably shot uh, earlier. You know, late '80s, early '90s, but um, you know, like that's not the Bronx. Like, you know, it's like, you know, well, but, you know, I, I mean, I don't know if it's specifically Italians, but I think Europeans and maybe specifically Italians were obviously obsessed with the Wild West in America, mm-hmm. and so what would be kind of the modern day Wild West at the time? Probably the Bronx. Probably the Bronx. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And they, they were on a warrior's kick. And they were clearly on an escape from New York kick. Yeah. Um, this is probably coming off the heels of also Mad Max and Road Warrior. So, like, they're... Or at least Mad Max, I think. Yeah. Um, yeah. Uh, uh, no, Road Warrior, I think, came out in 82. Okay, yeah. yeah. So, yeah, it kind of it kind of all makes sense. And then all, uh, and, and the obsession with flamethrowers too. I wonder if that's like sort of a, a, a well, nod to the Bronx fires. It, it could be, but I also think that might have more because with the Vietnam had just came on the hills, and there's a lot of famous imagery of the soldiers with flamethrowers. Um, that could be a nod, kind of, to that as well. Uh, both of those things, you know, with the Bronx on fire. Yeah. And I mean, it's it's brutal and it. It looks cool in slow motion. There's a bunch yeah, of yeah. It looks shit. great in slow motion. Very brutal. It's also very like you know. It's it's still kind of like a, a murdering somebody from a distance, but yet way more personal than like a gun. Yeah. Is. Yeah. Just because of the brutality of it. Um. Yeah. So. Uh, yeah, and I think yeah, that's what it was, right? It was it was trying to depict a sort of genocide. So you're gonna go full in, and so it's like, what you know, what what can you show? You're gonna show. Yeah. Mass shootings, and you're going to show flamethrowers, you know. But like you said, flamethrower might not be. <laughs> if you wanted to wipe out everybody that lived in the Bronx, might not be the most practical weapon. Yeah, you would. You wouldn't think that would that would be the most efficient, you know. Um, what I learned from this film is that um, if you have a revolver and you shoot at a helicopter <laughs> about four or five times, you will blow the entire helicopter up. Um, this also works with vans <laughs> and uh, Porsche 911. What was Porsche? Oh, sorry, Porsche 911. Yeah, I, I didn't, well, not to go off topic, but yeah, I, until a about two months ago, did not know that it's actually called Porsche and not just Porsche. All my life I called it, you know, Porsche, Porsche. Yeah, that's but what it's, I call it's, it. It's, it's, I, it. Technically, uh, it's I mean, Porsche 911. Yeah, Porsche. Porsche. Um, but yes, the the helicopter blimp, like it's it's that is kind of almost a laugh out scene, laugh out loud scene because of I mean shooting a gun from the ground up I don't know let's say two hundred feet just to be nice two hundred feet away with like four bullets and the explosion is kind of funny because it has like this little dummy model that like is stuck in one position that kind of flips out of the <laughs> helicopter. Um, I mean it's it's. Like, I appreciate the craft, but it, there is, like, a nice little chuckle moment. And then my the last thing, which I... It's, like, offensive, but I could not help finding it humorous, is that, that there's a child in the film. A hand, it, the kid is really good at throwing hand grenades. He's, he's probably... looks, like, to be about eight, and he's, this kid's got, like... He's like John Elway. <laughs> he's, like... I'm not a sports guy. Is that a good reference? Uh, from yeah, if we were in the <laughs> 90s, doing this. Uh, he's like Tom he, Brady. He's like uh, Tom. Tom Brady. Uh, he's like Tom Brady. If Tom Brady was good looking, um, and uh, he's throwing grenades and things uh, are blowing up left and right. Also, the kid uh, seems to have a thing for yelling out homophobic uh, <laughs> slurs. Yeah, which yeah. just coming out of a, a, a child's mouth is very. Uh, it, there's no, I mean, I I busted out laughing because I was like, "What the fuck?" Yeah, again, going back to sleepaway camp and things that they wouldn't do in a movie today. That is something I also don't think they would <laughs> um, do in any major film. I think even B movies might be afraid to even touch having a child um, say those terms. <laughs> yeah, but it, yes, it, 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 it definitely um, elicited a chuckle for me. Yeah. Um, so yeah, I don't know what to say. I mean, I, you know, when we talk about movies, we don't 
we don't rate them. We just talk about um, you know what we liked about them or, or what what not. But I think in honor of Joe Bob Briggs, I'm gonna I'm just this once. I'm gonna go. Four stars. Four, four stars, stars from Escape from the Bronx. You know? Four stars from Escape from the Bronx. I would have to concur. I mean, it was an enjoyable film. I'm glad like I, we've watched this Bronx trilogy. Like I've enjoyed all three of them in different ways. I give them all four stars. Um, and like I say, they're kind of an unofficial trilogy. Yeah. I, I, we're working at racking our brains about like what to call this because of the spaghetti western. I was thinking maybe Lasagna Apocalypse. <laughs> oh, Lasagna Apocalypse. That's pretty good. Yeah, because um, they're kind of apocalyptic movies. Zombie or Lasagna Apocalypticos. I don't know. Yeah, I was I was going to call it something like Spaghetti Bronx Wasteland Pictures. I don't know. <laughs> Carbonara Wasteland. <laughs> I don't know. We're still working We're still working on that, yeah. So the, the same director directed all three? No, no. The other movie was directed by somebody else. I can't remember his name now. But these last two were, direct, were directed by the same director. The but other first film was an Italian movie. Italian Bronx-based gang movie. Yeah. And that was Bronx Executioner. Then we had 1990 Bronx Warrior. Yeah. And then same director and some of the same cast, uh, Escape from the Bronx, a.k.a. Uh, Bronx Escape Warrior 2000. Two or, yeah. yeah. Um, also, like the first movie, The Bronx Executioner, uh, some of the scenes were pulled from another movie called Final Executioner, which is also available to watch, and maybe at some other point we'll attempt that one as well. There is a few... I saw one list. There is at least a couple more um, Bronx po- post-apocalyptic. I don't know <laughs> if they're Italian. They're, they may not be. All right. But uh, that's that's something I might I might look into. I I think I think of Escape from the Bronx as the Dark Knight of the, uh, the this it's, it's, whatever would you call it lasagna uh, lasagna apocalypse movies Las, lasagna apocalypse apocalypse movies yeah um, I because I I just think the quality was better I thought it was a little tighter um, which is fitting because we are on the exact ten year anniversary of Dark Knight being released ah yeah that's crazy right wow. yeah yeah ten years didn't seem that long ago. Like I can remember, I was in Afghanistan, came home on an R and R in August. Like I think it was the first week in August, and Christy, my wife, we went to go see that movie. And um, yeah, the rest is history. I mean, it's like it's the film still holds up. We watched it last night mm. just to kind of like reminisce and have some nostalgia about our like little date that we went on to go see it. But yeah, yeah, it's still a great little film. Still great, yeah. Little film, <laughs> great, little, little great, film. huge film. Oh, yeah. Speaking of filming, so Ooh. I got this uh, for those who may be watching out there on the Twitch feed. Um, I got this uh, CineLens. It's uh, SLR Magic is the brand. Let's see. I don't know. You might be able to see that SLR Magic, and uh, it's a thirty-five millimeter. Uh, 1.4 T1.4 the T stop versus the F stop and this is going to go with which camera that you have? this will go with the GH4 and uh, good thing about the cinema lenses is they have they're geared so you could add a follow focus and also the distance that you uh, can pull focus is, is greater so that it's more accurate. It's easier to actually make cinematic focus pulls, but yeah, yeah, that that smooth um, pull focus is it's very important. If you watch any major um, cinema film and you see them, you know, rack focus from like you know the foreground to the background, they obviously will have one of these. Yeah, and that's what you realize too. You know, that it's it's not fair per se. Like they're using like you know the lenses could be thirty thousand dollar lenses. And which and it means that it's easier for them to pull focus. It's easier to, for them to get beautiful shots. You know. Yeah. Um, we were going through. I was showing some uh, cameras off the other day, and uh, this uh, guy I worked with Frank. He was showing off his Ursa Mini. So he was shooting at night. Um, he man, I think he had a prime on there, which means it didn't. It was fast, so it didn't eat up that much light. So he was able to shoot at like a 400 speed at night without additional nice. lighting, and it was totally clean. It's That's like, amazing. You know, yeah, yeah, right? So it's, it's, you know, if you get, 
the more expensive gear is going to give you more consistency, and it yeah. gives you that edge, you know. Um, and that's the thing with the, it's a what, 1.4 for the F-stop, the T-stop, yeah. which, you know, that's um, extremely fast lens so that, you know, you have uh, the ability to, you know, more light to come in and mm -hmm. when you hit the sensor. So, yeah, you can shoot in, like, you know, more low-light areas. Yeah. And for the GH4, which I have, GH5 is, is much, uh, has higher ISOs, but um, uh, the... Um, well, the 4 is no slouch, right? Like it, it, yeah, it, it, it goes up fairly high. I forget what the max is, but, you know, it's, it's probably above 6,400 or something like that, you know. I mean, it's an amazing time that we're living in. We're, we're the democratization of, you know, film and everything like that, the cameras and stuff. Like, there's not a huge difference between, like, what a like a smaller independent studio can shoot versus what you can go and shoot yourself without like, you know, spending millions of dollars. Yeah, if you had I'd say ten grand, you could get everything you need to shoot a gorgeous, you know, four K film with cinema lenses, you know. Yeah. Have you seen speaking of shooting films, have you seen Soderbergh's uh, most recent film, Unsane, that he shot on an iPhone? No, I, I I like Soderbergh. Sometimes I think he gets a little too uh, cool for school with his uh, filming. What, I mean, what did you what do you think? It's an okay movie. I mean, it. Um, it, it well, I will say it it rises above the ranks of being like a Lifetime esque movie because you have this. It's about a, a stalker, and I, but I don't know what what the iPhone did per se outside of being like something he could talk about it's whenever gimmick. he gimmick yeah. yeah and the thing the thing that I don't like about that is that you can get a Lumex G7 Panasonic DSLR camera for it's less than $500 now so you could get it for probably 450 with a stock lens a very decent stock lens you could shoot in 4K with a real lens so you can do things like pull focus. You can zoom in to 50 millimeters to get shallow depth of field. Um, you'll get more color space. You'll get more dynamic range. So the, the can you shoot on a you know an iPhone? Yeah, you can. But some of those iPhones are a thousand dollars. Oh yeah. You know oh, it's yeah. like the DSLR is half the price. You know so part part of me really gets. Um, I think people think it's something to like brag about or it's like a cute kitschy thing. I shot this on my iPhone. It's like okay, but for half the price you could have had decent glass. Yeah. You know, you could have had more control over the image. So wh why you're bragging about spending more actually and it's kind of idiotic. But Yeah, for a person like Soderbergh, I mean, the only thing I can say is like if he's doing it to kind of like say to other Younger filmmakers like don't let the camera get in your way of shooting film. But the thing is, we've already we've already seen other people do it. The movie Tangerine was one of the first major films, and it was accepted, I think, to Cannes. That came out years ago. Yeah, that was years ago. So it wasn't like he was covering some new ground to inspire filmmakers. But like I say, it gave him something new to talk about, I guess. But he also, again, they had to use little little lenses that were made specifically for the iPhone. Um, the sound was great, so they were probably using, you know, once again, they were using extremely system. expensive... They are using yeah. two-system sound. You know, um, and they had a little um, gimbal device that they could use so they get, you know, smooth tracking shots. And when it was... I was looking at it, it's, it's in a weird aspect ratio, too. It's not 4x3, and it's not 16x9. It's some weird aspect ratio that I don't know why it was done that way. He probably just did it because it's different. You know what yeah. I mean? And again, like like you say, I like Soderbergh's work. Sometimes, though, he allows these little things to become more than the film itself, instead of like you know concentrating on on, on the work. And he's supposed to be a guy who said he was going to stop making movies, but I mean, he made this movie. So, I mean, I, I don't want to discourage him from working. Like he does make some good movies. Oh, when they're great, they're great. Yeah. Um, I I still I love Schizopolis, which is probably his least popular film. And uh, uh, traffic, yeah, 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 I still yeah, love traffic. traffic yeah. good, yeah. yeah. But, uh, yeah, this is a really cool... It's nice and hefty, too. That's the difference between, I, I guess, you know, like a lot of the like cheaper um, uh, kit lenses you'll see. It has a nice, nice, like, you know, good, strong body. Like, the glass, I yeah. think, is very heavy. 
heavy glass, solid metal. Yeah. Um, yeah, so it's it's pretty pretty decent lens. So SLR Magic, and I've done some tests, and uh, the stuff looks pretty good. Um, it's comparable image-wise to Rokinon, which is a Rokinon's a it's almost double the price. Um, but this, if you if you opened it wide open, mm -hmm. uh, it actually loses uh, focus a little. Yeah, so. that's uh, well. That's one of the things with uh, a lot of the faster lenses too. Like the sharpness will, like you know, if you open it all the way up, um, you could lose you lose a little bit of your sharpness with it. So there is just like with the camera and the ISO that it's rated has like a sweet spot. The lenses also have like this sweet spot for sharpness as well. Yep. So SLR Magic 35 millimeter um, T 1.4, and I think I paid two. Say 260 for it. That's off Amazon. Off of yeah, Amazon. Yeah, uh, Adorama. Adorama. So, yeah. Yeah. Nice so that's pretty cool. Um. Yeah. I don't know. That's all I got. You got anything else? That's all I got too. I mean, oh, do we want to talk about like, uh, oh, well, like the lens and stuff, like the VHS massacres? Oh yeah, like, sure. Yeah. I don't know if you want to like you just mention who, who. Well, I think we mentioned this last week who our first interview is going to be. Yeah, yeah. So um, we're going to be interviewing um, W. Rashan on the 29th, and um, we're going to be using this this lens, the GH4, and probably your Blackmagic setup too as a second camera. Actually, Fra Frank, this guy Frank might come with his Ursa Mini. We might Ooh. have a a shootout, you know. Nice. Uh, we're gonna try to do a nice three camera shoot, but we're gonna be interviewing um, uh, Debbie Rashan, and um, also she had said that um, Joe Bob Briggs is interested in, in coming out again and um, and 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 doing an interview with us. I don't think it's gonna be on that same date. I'm I'm excited to interview him again, though. After you know, when we interviewed him, he was kind of like if. If you're measuring his career in peaks and valleys, and I, not to say that he has peaks and valleys in his career, but it would probably be more in the, the valley. And now he's, I feel like he's, you know, he's he's back in the mainstream. He broke the internet and all that, like we talked about. Yeah, so. I mean, it had been, I think he says it had been 17 years since he had a, at least a, a, a drive-in or a monster show. Yeah. And I, although he probably, he, I think he did Daily Show after that, and he, you know, he he does like he he'll go and host a screening it at. Alamo Draft House all the time. Yeah, up here in Yonkers, like not far away. He's like yeah. he's up there almost. I think like maybe monthly or maybe even weekly. Yeah, definitely and he, monthly. He writes too. He writes a lot too. Yeah. So um, he he's he's always been active, but he he in that marathon said that he didn't think it would be so long between shows. You know. No, I don't think. Especially if you look at his career. He went, actually, I think it was like maybe six months between doing the, the movie channel show to doing Monster Vision, which that's like no time at all. Mm -hmm. Like, you know, like you go from one to the other. And I think you look at it like from Monster Vision, like it's like, okay, where's the next, you know, okay, what's the next channel? Sci fi, whatever, whatever it's going to be. And it didn't happen. And it's kind of sad. I don't know. I don't know if maybe, because 9 11 happened like right after, I think, Monster Vision, and that kind of changed programming and. Not to say like the that Joe Bob never made it back home because of nine eleven because that well, the one and the two don't have a direct correlation but nine eleven did change some vibes of things that you know yeah, of I, culture I think so I think I think also um, the nature of his drive-in show and pushing trash cinema like it I can see how there wasn't always venues for him you yeah. know what I mean. But I don't I don't understand why something like Cinemax wouldn't reach out to him in like two thousand and you know, seven or something and give him a show then. You know, that yeah. that doesn't make sense to me. Like there are plenty of those. Uh AMC Spike? You yeah, know, like absolutely, yeah, a ton of networks out there that, you know, it came along, uh, G4, whenever they were doing video that that was the video game channel. Mm -hmm. That would have been kind of perfect too, because I think a lot of that that nerd pop culture audience would have translated to what Joe Bob was doing. If you look, the angry angry video game nerd, one of the biggest supporters of Joe Bob, um, mm -hmm. uh, he would fit on G four just as easily as you know uh, Joe Bob would. Um, so yeah, it's 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 to me kind of embarrassing for Hollywood and all these entertainment companies not to utilize this great tool, put them on their network because I don't know the, the the exact ratings that Monster Vision got back in the day. 
Um, but I know when he was on the movie channel, it was like by far the most popular show that they had. Mm-hmm. Um, the, the reason why he, they canceled the show is because they wanted to move in a different direction. Yeah. So that's the reason why that show went away. And the Monster Vision, though, I, th- I mean, I don't know why exactly they canceled it. But I'm sure they did good ratings there, too. And, yeah. Yeah, and I, I I always loved the concept too of like you know this sort of late night show that would come on, and uh, you know it's it's cheap, it's a cheap show to produce. So I never understood why those type of shows went away. I, I guess they sort of fell out of fashion, maybe somehow. I, I guess I mean if you look at the, especially like uh, when he was on Monster Vision, which that was my like I saw a little bit of him on the Movie Channel, but um. Actually, actually, that's where I saw the Sleepaway Camp the first time was on the movie channel when I probably shouldn't have been seeing it at that age. I saw a lot of movies I shouldn't have been seeing at that age. The, the Thing was one of those other ones that <laughs> oh, should not have seen when I was like five years old. But um, uh, when he was on Monster Vision in the you know mid '90s, as a teenage boy, that was perfect. But you grow out of being a teenage boy, and girls come along, school comes along, these different things come along, and they kind of pull you away, and maybe. A lot of that audience, that core audience, got kind of pulled away, and it wasn't being replaced with the same type of kids, you know. Yeah, that's interesting. Well, now that we're all middle-aged, maybe that's... We're really craving this Joe Bob show, you know? Yeah, well, I mean, like, my... I've, I've, I don't say, like, I'm um, an immature adult or whatever, but, like, I, you kind of come back around to it now. Like, I'm, I'm grown. I have certain things that I like. I'm, I think I'm more precise with the things that I want to view and the things that I crave and Joe Bob hosting movies is one of those things that I absolutely want to see and it's unfortunate with like YouTube he, they can't post the full movies like they have a bunch of Monster Vision segments which have him just talking about the movies and those are great and he's great to listen to but it's to have the whole film to kind of like yeah it's, it's a whole experience people complain about that and um, if you go on Shutter. The last couple of videos are just sort of like you know testimony why why they like Joe Bob and uh, people are uh, they're just they're pissed they're like yeah you know Monster Vision was this TNT show this big cable network it's yeah. Turner you know Turner Ted Turner right so yeah. they're like you're gonna make me watch a VHS dub off of YouTube and it's without the movie in there and they're kind of like fuck you you know like where is this stuff you know. Yeah, I know the TNT Turner, they have that stuff. And, I mean, there might be a rights issue. I'm sure there's definitely rights issues that go into this. But you would like to see them work this out. Like, I, hopefully the Shutter thing grows into something bigger. And then maybe maybe we'll see the, some of the Monster Vision stuff come along, things that are easier to acquire, acquire the rights. I mean, I would absolutely would love to see the whole catalog because there were some things that I missed along the way. But I would still love to go, like, see some of these. Um, but... I mean, and that's the kind of the, the, the great feeling that I got from, like, when I sat down and watched that Tourist Trap episode. It was like, I have this, though. And not only do I have this, I have technically, I think, 13 movies that I can watch right here with Joe Bob. Yeah. Yeah, it's it's really wonderful. And that's why I'm like, they got it. They got it. They got to have him do it again. And I don't know if he, you know, he might be like, dude, it might take him six months <laughs> to plan and recover or, you know it's like I don't. what do you have to do to you know hopefully he got some sleep and that's 24 hours but yeah it, honestly even if he did it once a year you'd have 12 episodes a year yeah. you know I, I mean, mean that's pretty awesome absolutely um, I think though if in terms of thinking of like Shudder is a business I think business wise they should find a way like I would stay with Shudder like it's it's a little bit expensive for the four ninety nine compared to like a Netflix, which has yeah. like a lot more selection. Though I will argue that a lot of the selection is bad. But uh, uh, if Shutter was to like somehow find a way to do like one or two movies a month with Joe Bob, I would absolutely maintain my subscription over the year. Yeah, um, that's true. Uh, like I'm, I'm going to, you know, I, I already did the the my free trials over with, and I'm paying them the four ninety nine this month so that I can watch. The rest of these, because you know, I want to get to them and uh, enjoy them, uh, and I'll decide then if I maintain my subscription. It depends on like the other selection of movies and stuff. But with Joe Bob, I could promise him like if you if you do once a month of something a content from him, I will, I will gladly hand over four ninety nine so I can have some Joe Bob in my life. Yeah, I would do it. I would do it. Yeah, I mean if he's up 
if he's up for it, do a weekly show. That'd be great. Yeah. Yeah, that's the other thing. It's like, we don't know if Joe Bob really... Well, he is, talked about this as the last time. He, yeah. He, he repeatedly, he was like, I'm, this is the last time I'm doing it. Yeah, yeah. That's the kind of thing. It's like, uh, I wish you wouldn't be saying that. Because I'd be... Once, especially once it broke the shutter thing, it's like, this is... Like, there is a demand, and it's not just, yeah. like, myself, you, or, yeah. you know... And it's not just, like, the 500 people used to attend horror conventions like 10 years ago or whatever yeah. it's like it's a it's a whole it's thousands and thousands yeah and when you start thinking about it because I was thinking about this today when I was watching Sleepaway Camp that Shudder knew that Joe Bob was going to be on there and they knew that there was going to be a demand and Shudder is an app that's been around for a couple of years so they they know like what their peak you know um, traffic is so you know they had to be prepared that they were going to see a spike but their preparedness for that spike wasn't even good enough. Like no. it, so, it, it exceeded even their expectations. It it it, it had to. Te- yeah. it, it technically exceeded their c- capabilities, which means they either um, they, like didn't plan well enough, or it just they were overrun. You know, and, and that's that's wonderful. It's a wonderful yeah. for him too. If if he just says, you know what, nah, that was great. I don't need to do it again. I guess you know that's fine. I'll, I'll, I'll be disappointed, but yeah. I mean, shut as long as Shutter around, we'll have those. We'll have those twelve episodes or, or thirteen yeah. episodes, right? Now. Yeah, I think it's technically it's thirteen episodes. I think there's they did an extra movie, um, which is great. Like I'm glad that they, you know, that's even more stuff than we were initially promised. Uh, yeah, and like you say, the thing is that these are they're absolutely rewatchable just because of even the movies themselves, unlike the TNT versions, which sometimes were bastardized. They, you know. You wouldn't have any of the boobs. All the swear words would either be replaced with like really funny stuff, or they wouldn't even have them at all. So with the Shutter, you're seeing the movies in their full versions. Like you got the surprise ending of In Sleepaway Camp yeah. and all of its glory or non glory. That's so, great hearing Joe Bob just swear and like yeah. there was one time he was talking about like independent film directors and method actors, and he's like. They don't like that shit on the set, you know. It was like, you know, uh, it was great. You know, yeah. just hearing him just let loose was great. Yeah, and like you say, he is a master storyteller, so they will always make those episodes rewatchable. Yep. Yeah. yeah. Well, anyway, so we'll let you know. I guess we're back next week. We got to find a new movie to watch. Yeah, a new movie to watch. I think we'll move away a little bit from the Bronx. <laughs> so. we'll take a a week away from the Bronx. Thanks everyone for watching. Um, thanks for checking this out on, on Twitch. Yes. Hopefully this uh, this works out well. Um, I'm your host, Tom Seymour. I'm your other host, Ken Powell. Check you later.